Okay, well, in the previous parts, as you may remember, I discussed whether ghosts were physically present, um, whether they occupied physical space, whether photons would reflect on them, or whether they were constructs that are generated by the mind in the same way that hallucinations or dreams are, and what their ontological status is. That is, are they real things or are they just subjective things that we imagine? And I argue usually that ghosts are real in some sense that they are things we can all experience. And a few weeks ago, we had a fascinating talk by um, Rob Gandhi, where he talked about cellular memory and how transplants can result in personality traits being passed on. And he suggested that there was a link between, cell between cellular life and memory. And that made me suddenly remember that I'd been meaning to talk about this for a long time. So. One of the first things you're told when you get interested in ghost research is ghosts don't haunt graveyards. It's just folklore. There is no relationship between hauntings and human remains. Why would there be? I mean, if I drop dead now, which I must admit I feel a bit like I might, then I'm more likely, I think, to try and haunt Cheltenham Ladies College. No, that's a bit crass. I might go somewhere a bit more tasteful, but I'm much more likely to haunt a cinema or somewhere with something going on than a graveyard. But in folklore, there's a very, very strong relationship between human remains and hauntings. Um, none of the popular models in parapsychology or in apparitions, neither Tyrrell's, Gurney's, Podmore's, Myers, any of the ideas that I've seen put forward have suggested a particular link between human remains and uh, apparitions. But folklore does, and of course, so does spiritualism. So let's start there. In fact, the very first ghost story that we still have recorded is that of Apandodorus Canites. And he's writing in Athens long before Christ, centuries before Christ. I think it's about 300 years before Christ, but I could be wrong. Uh, he's a philosopher. I think he was a Stoic, but I'm not sure. Seems a bit early for that. No, he was probably a follower of Xenocrates, one of the, that bunch. But anyway, that doesn't matter. He was a philosopher and a scholar. And he was also, like many philosophers and scholars down the ages, extremely poor, or at least not wealthy. So when he came to Athens, he needed somewhere to live. And he found a house that was going really cheap, in fact, suspiciously cheap. And he took it and set about writing. And on the first night, ooh, rattle, 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 the traditional chain rattling ghost. And I like to think this is where it actually began with Athenodorus. The ghost appears, and we've got a 19th century, I think, illustration here of Athenodorus and the ghost. And he ignored it. And on the second night, ooh, this sounds like one of my shaggy dog stories, doesn't it? The ghost returns and this time, he eventually, after finishing whatever it is he's writing, a letter or whatever, he looks at the ghost to see what the ghost wants. And the ghost, still clanking its chains melodramatically, turns around and walks into the courtyard and walks to one corner of the courtyard where it gestures or disappears. So, of course, the next day, him and his servants fetch a spade and they dig up the uh, spot and there they find the remains of a man bound in chains and buried there without due ceremony. So they arrange for the body to be properly buried. And as a result, no more ghost, much cheap rent, no haunting. Everybody wins. Now, if anyone knows of a house that has a chain rattling ghost and exceptionally low rent, A, it would be quite useful from a research viewpoint. B, I could do with paying less rent. Who couldn't? So <laughs> just let me know. But that's the archetypal ghost story that entered into uh, pretty much all of the uh, volumes of classical ghosts. And through the 19th century, ancient Greek, uh, from the 18th century onwards, really, ancient uh, Greek and Latin specialists would tell that story as being the first ghost story. There are obviously earlier ghost stories, but it's the, it's the closest to a modern type of a ghost story, type in the sense of Old Testament scholarship, but that's not important for the moment. 1840, uh, 1848 was it? I can't remember, 1843 maybe. Anyway, Hydesville, New York, upstate New York. The cabin belonging to the Fox sisters begins to have bangs, raps, 
strange knockings, mysterious phenomena. And eventually they come up with the idea of calling out, is there anybody there? And from here, spiritualism is born. And they discover by the knock once for yes and twice for no, that after a while they can communicate with the ghost. And they also try calling out the letters, the alphabet, or having it knock a number of, yeah. They, they invent alphabet codes quite quickly. And spiritualism becomes a huge craze and then a global religion. But it all starts in Hydesville. And there is a quite complex, and I'm not going to do it justice tonight. I haven't got time, so I'm not going to even try. But there is a, an interesting story that, because the messages they receive claim to be from a peddler who had passed through the area and had been carrying money, as many peddlers did, traveling salesmen, and had, as many did, disappeared, because of course they would jump on a train and go to another town, or they would leave town anyway with their profits having done their trading. And he's said to have stayed in the um, cottage, or the cabin where the foxes lived, uh, sometime before they took possession of it, and not been seen since. And there were rumors flying around the small community that a murder might have been done. And that was the the um, claim was that there were human remains buried in the basement. And many after some time, there was some excavations and it said that human remains were found. And again, in the 1930s, when they excavated the basis of the cabin, the foundations of the cabin, I believe, again, they said they found human remains. So right at the very beginning of spiritualism, there's this idea again of buried bones and an apparition linked to them. So, okay, if an apparition is actually a spirit of a dead person, that makes perfect sense. But as we've already seen, that's quite a complicated argument, whether it is or isn't. So, are graveyards haunted? When you become a ghost hunter, the first thing they say is no, ghost graveyards are not haunted because nobody dies in a graveyard. Uh, largely speaking, true. It's uh, unlikely that you'll die in a graveyard, though people who visit them are older than average, probably, because they're seeing their loved ones who are probably older. And perhaps under great emotional stress, some people do die in graveyards, but it's relatively uncommon. And we know that it's not the case, however, but despite the fact it's a truism that nobody dies in a graveyard, because Claire Davy recently did a rather splendid talk in which she went through a bunch of seriously haunted graveyards from around the world. That is on YouTube already, I believe, so you can go and enjoy that, which would probably be better than watching me. So, are graveyards haunted? Well, maybe so. Well, let's have a look at this grave matter. To my mind, the best ghost photo ever is this one from Bachelors Grove, taken by the Chicago Ghost Research Society uh, about 30 years, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And this is what they said. After the film was processed, it was discovered on one frame there was the unmistakable image of a strange woman sitting on a checkerboard tombstone in an old fashioned turn of the century full length dress. She had brown hair and was gazing off into the distance in profile. On closer examination, parts of her body are semi-transparent, especially her legs, head and legs. Everyone on the team was stunned with this revelation as it seemed to coincide with electromagnetic deviations team members were experiencing at the time. It's one of the clearest images this author's ever seen today. It was taken by Jude Huff Feltz. So I'm assuming that you can all see exactly as described a lady sitting on a tombstone. And to my mind, it's clearly not a simulacra. It's clearly either a physical woman who was sitting there and who was present, perhaps only for a moment or two before she realised she was in shot. Maybe it was a long exposure and she managed to leave. I don't know. Or alternatively, it's a hoax or it's a ghost, which means we can photograph ghosts. Um, I've never actually met Dale Kasim I can't say his name, Dale or any of the Chicago Ghost Research Society, but I would love to learn more about them. We really should ask him to come along. I've always said that'd be great to have them come and talk about their work at Bachelors Grove. But it is, I think, one of the absolute classic ghost photos, isn't it? So it took part in a ceremony. And in Chicago, we also have the story of Resurrection Mary. And again, connected with the Resurrection uh, Cemetery. It's a phantom hitchhiker story. It's a haunted graveyard story. Again, we've got this connection. 
flip over to just down the road from me. I took this uh, last summer. I think it was or the summer before. I live in Cheltenham on the outskirts near the village of Presbury, which is a suburb of Cheltenham. This is Presbury High Street. And those of you who can remember the Guinness Book of Records from the 70s and 80s will remember that Presbury and Cluckley were listed as the most haunted places in the world, or the most haunted villages in England. And they contest with one another as to which has the most ghosts. Anyway, the whole notion of most haunted or where is most haunted is a bit daft, but let's move on because there's one very famous ghost associated with Presbury, and it is in the graveyard. Now, the photo on the left is not an amazing example of a ghost photo. Well, it is, but it is definitely a fake. It was created by a journalist. It appeared on the front cover of the, uh, by a professional photographer. Whose name, oh, I should have credited him. Anyway, he's amazing. So I'll find out who it is and put it in the notes afterwards. But he did a great job. It appeared in the Gloucestershire Echo, then it appeared on the front cover of the 40 and Times. And what it shows is the purported ghost of Presbury Churchyard, which is the Black Abbot. And he is meant to haunt at Lammas Tide, Halloween, uh, Christmas, and the other one, which I forget. Uh, but the four quarter uh, festivals, kind of equinoxal festivals of the year or thereabouts. And he is meant to walk through the graveyard. I've got a story about that, but I'll come to that in a minute. On the right is the vicar of Presbury at the moment. And he's a young man who has very strong opinions, it seems. And one of his opinions is that ghost hunters should not uh, run around in churchyards because it's disrespectful to the dead. And I think we can all agree with that. I mean, why would you want to allow people to trample over graves, to cause noise, to cause offence? And I have much sympathy, but there was a ghost tour that had been operating in Presbury, and I'd done plenty myself, but I'd hope that I was fairly respectful in the graveyard. Let's have a look at the graveyard, actually. Oops, there we go. That's a couple of my photos of Presbury graveyard taken when I've been walking back from the pub at night uh, past the plough. And I must admit that I have been there many, many, many times. One of my friends from college lived just opposite. And today, I have never yet seen the Black Abbot, which is a bit depressing, isn't it? You would hope that I may have done. What I have done is seen a lot of ghost hunters there. And I'll tell my story because it's mildly amusing and does involve ghosts and human remains, I guess. Um, back in the 90s, I formed a ghost hunting group called the Cheltenham Psychic Research Group. And I think it was Halloween 95, but you can Google it. I'm sure it will be on the internet on one of the newspaper sites by now. What happened was uh, Central TV or some such decided to do a live broadcast from the churchyard on Halloween. And they arranged it with the church wardens. And they um, previewed it by flashing up that it was going to take place. You know, it was only going to be like a five minute piece about the ghosts of Halloween and, you know, and a couple of interviews. And they asked me to go on and be interviewed. And I declined because I could see that this could actually prove A, difficult, and B, I wasn't very happy about appearing in a graveyard at night because I thought it encouraged the wrong kind of behaviour. Um, and also I was giving a lecture on hauntings, epiphenomenalism and dualism, uh, states of consciousness, philosophy of mind, and what is a ghost at the other end of town which I think completely confused many people who came along to it, but they had a good time anyway. Some of them actually stayed around and dragged them me afterwards. About midnight, we arrived at the churchyard and we discovered that the camera crews had left, but my friends who were there were absolutely in a terrible state because they'd wandered along and there were about 200, 300 people had turned up and they were drunken and they were shouting and they were essentially rioting. <laughs> So I called the police. I went to the phone box and called the police. And then I went and jumped on a uh, bench and shouted, by the power invested in me under the Public Order Act 1931, i.e. the Riot Act, I order you to disperse. I order you to disperse. I order you to disperse. And having attempted to invoke the only piece of legislation I knew as a historian that might be relevant, some of them buggered off and others waited till they heard the sirens. And my best the best thing about this riot in the churchyard was that 
one of the journalists who'd been there was clearly slightly overcome by the excitement of the evening. No ghosts were seen, but they talked about how crowds of rowdy youths had drunk vodka and attempted to contact the dead with iron bars and damaged property with Ouija boards. I think they got that the wrong way round. But anyway. Oh, dear. So riots are associated with hauntings, it seems. But let's move on from that. Here is Baldy in Suffolk, another place which has had more than its share of public disorder associated with hauntings. The rectory are burnt down in 39, I think. Yeah, February 1939, just before the war. And it remained through to the 50s. It was cleared. The site was cleared in the early 50s, finally, of the bricks and the, the rubble. And there were some excavations there after the war. But there's nothing to see at Borley anymore, just three bungalows, a couple of houses and some very irate locals and a direct um, microphone. It used to be, but I think they've got cameras now to Sudbury Cop Shop. So soon after you turn up, the police turn up and move you on, at least at night. But you might think, well, OK, we've got off bodies onto riots. I'm going to come back to the bodies in a moment. But isn't it terrible that youth today is so dreadful, bloody children? But actually, it was happening as far back as when Harry Price was there in the 20s. In fact, in, when the Bulls were first there, there were occasions when rowdy people from Sudbury came up and shouted while looking for the ghost of the um, phantom coach that was meant to run up the hill past Borley Rectory. And Price himself was warned against going to the newspapers because of the fact that many of the locals were being troubled even at the right time by people who were coming from as far as London in most cars to look for the alleged ghosts. Anyway, the only reason I mentioned Borley was because Borley, as some of you will know, there was a so-called Maria Lair, a ghostly nun who was only discovered through um, wall writings, supposed wall writings from uh, connected with Marianne Foister. And a skull was discovered when the Bull sisters uh, were there. The skull was apparently kept in the cupboard under the stairs, uh, wrapped up in brown paper in a shoebox. And uh, when they moved out, the, their uh, successors to the living opened it up and found a human skull. And it was quietly buried across in the churchyard in the unmarked grave. So the human remains are no longer available, but to, to be examined. But it's an important part of the Borley Rectory that there were human remains on the site that were associated with the hauntings. And if you think back to Caroline's story about the screaming skull, uh, the one in Somerset, not the famous one in Cumbria, but either of them, screaming skulls, again, are another very strong connection between human remains and hauntings. So let's move on again. This time we're going to Bury St Edmunds. And these are some photos I took when I was home last. This is where my parents lived for much of my life uh, there or just north at the farm. And it's quite an atmospheric place, isn't it? Uh, you can see here on the left, the Abbey Gate. And then if you go a little bit along the road, you've got the great churchyard and that starts behind the Norman Tower on the right, which is actually Saxon, but there you go. But it's a pretty gothic kind of place and Romanesque, technically. If we go just behind this, we come into the great churchyard. On the right is the charnel house. Now, if you're actually being a tourist in Bury, it's important to ask for the charnel house, not the carnal house, because a carnal house is something very different. It's not my friend's joke. <laughs> but the charnel house, uh, the chapel of the charnel, was a uh, chapel in the graveyard which was dedicated to human remains when a grave was reused after a certain period of time the bones would be dug up the bones were then taken to the chapel of the charnel and were stacked in a kind of ossuary style crypt a catacomb underneath this building um i've put a couple of the graves on the left sarah lloyd who i think was about 20 when she was hanged in front of a huge crowd she was remarkably good looking, which was why people came and tried desperately to save her. Uh, they, they tried their best. There was a petition to the Home Secretary. He wouldn't have it. It's a horrible story because she was a servant girl who 
took on a new boyfriend and her boyfriend persuaded her to burgle her mistress and still let him and his mates into the house and they robbed her, robbed the mistress. And when they left, they set fire to it. Now, the mistress was actually disabled and she was upstairs. So it was quite a nasty crime because she would have burned to death. But luckily, uh, the neighbours did manage to rush in and rescue the disabled lady and carry her out. And the stolen goods were taken by Sarah, whose boyfriend said, look, we don't want to have it. It's too hot. Take the money and the possessions, the jewellery, and hide it at your folks' house out in the country. And then it won't be connected with us. So she did. And then finally, she the, the goods were found quite quickly. Um, she was missing from the house, which burnt down. Uh, it was clear she had something to do with it. And when she was caught, she confessed. And her boyfriend basically turned King's evidence or Queen's evidence, King's evidence in 1799 and said, yeah, she did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and my mates actually did the kind of robbery and the setting fire to things, but she let us in and it was all her fault and it was all her idea. And so they were all allowed to go and she was hanged. And uh, that's her tombstone. And her last words were, let my fate be an example to thousands. And if only we could get rid of more teenagers that way nowadays. On the right, there's an even grimmer story. And Mary Hasselton, who was a young maiden of this town of Roman Catholic parents, virtuously brought up, who being in the act of prayer, repeating her vespers, was instantaneously killed by a flash of lightning aged nine years. You can't help but think there's some kind of weird Anglican one-upmanship here about the fact she's a Roman Catholic, can you? And that God doesn't mind killing Roman Catholic pious girls for saying their prayers. It's a horrible tragedy, but it's nice to think that little Mary has been remembered all these years. And some have suggested that she served as the model for Dissard um, for his novel Justine, which is about a pious girl who has, is it that way around? I think it's, it's either Justine or Julia. One of them is about a pious girl who has terrible things happen to her and ends up dying wretchedly. And the other one is about this awful, awful, sinful sister of hers who has a wonderful time and ends up living to a ripe old age and enjoying everything. But um, it was his mocking of the pious when the story appeared in the papers. Also, getting back to Bury St Edmunds and human remains, we have here the West Front. And when the Great Abbey of Bury was collapsed, uh, was knocked down, uh, for building materials or fell into disrepair after the dissolution of the monasteries, houses were eventually built into the West Front. And uh, one of my friend's uh, mother lives in one of them at the moment. On the right, you can see another picture of the Great Churchyard. Why am I telling this story? Well, the churchyard at Bury was home to a young girl called Margareta Green, who was actually a distant relative of Graham Green, the novelist. But many, many, many years earlier. Um, I think she was mid-Victorian. And Margareta Green was also of a very prominent family because her father, I think it was, had formed a brewery with his friend Mr King, and Green King exists to this day. You may have drunk their beer. But Margareta published a book, and it's called the, A Secret, or The Secret, I can't remember which, but the wonderful Suffolk scholar and Barry Ladd, Francis Young, Dr. Francis Young, who's very active on Twitter, he's recently published uh, the first reprint of it in well over 100 years. And it tells a story featuring Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, uh, he whose wife had been taken off following the Witch of Eye affair, for those who've heard the story of Marjorie Gildermain. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Humphrey came to Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, was the brother of the king. Uh, he was a strong contender for the throne back in the Middle Ages. And he came to Bury St Edmunds on trumped up charges of treason to meet with the king and the court. And shortly after arriving, he died uh, somewhat mysteriously, but it was probably natural causes. And this story has echoed down the centuries. And Margareta said that when she was living in this house, she found a hidden compartment in the wall with the confession of a nun. And the nun had been desperately in love with a monk who previously had been an important courtier. 
And he had been hired or he had become involved in a plan uh, to do something which had annoyed Humphrey. And Humphrey was going to declare him to be a sinner and have him executed. So before Humphrey got to the court, she decided she would save her former love who'd become a monk and she'd become a nun in a kind of moment of madness following after him or something like that. So she decides that she's going to finish Humphrey off. So she takes poison and she goes down a tunnel, the Fornum. We'll get to the same spot again in a moment in another one of my stories. And she gives poison to this poor Duke Humphrey who dies. But then she goes to the monk and he wants nothing to do with her when he realises that she's committed murder. And luckily for her, perhaps, she's dropped some of the poison on her hands and she dies melodramatically. And her ghost is the Grey Lady of the Great Churchyard and is said to haunt the Abbey on every February the 24th. And she can be seen walking between the graves. Ooh. And can you guess what the result of this story was? Yep, you got it, a riot. In fact, there were several riots. And to this day, every February the 24th, disreputable Berry St Edmunds oiks and louts and ghost hunting lunatics, like, for example, Alan Murdy. I'm joking, not Alan, no, he is from Berry. Um, local ghost hunters and all kinds of other people will come down and look for the ghost, even though it's based on what is clearly a Victorian romance. But again, there's that kind of folkloric association of the graveyard and the haunting. And in fact, oddly enough, I was walking through there one night, cutting back up from down um, Rangate Street with a bunch of ghost hunters. And suddenly they said, over there, over there. And they turned around and I almost completely failed to see it. I thought I might have got a slight glimpse, but there were little yellowish white lights bobbing around amongst the graves because it's heavily overgrown the far end of the graveyard. And they suggested corpse candles, they suggested marsh lights, they suggested all kinds of things it could be. I wondered if it was fireflies, but we didn't stick around because we had to get to the pizza hut before it got dark. Oh, as if by magic, Alan Murdy has just arrived. And so it is that every February the 24th, hordes of unruly ghost hunters from Bury St Edmunds, who, as we all know, are the most disreputable types, descend upon the graveyard cause chaos and anarchy okay let's move on so oh, heading up to where do comfrey was supposedly done for as St. saviors and man egerton i've got another story that links hauntings with human remains it's one of my favorites because it involves me and in 1963 my father decided to build a bungalow at what's now called malt house lane he named it the Little Mermaid. It's nothing to do with the mermaid pits, which are just across the road on Fornham Road. He actually didn't know anything about that. I was amazed to find out. I assume that's why he called it the Little Mermaid. No, he just called it because my mother liked the Little Mermaid when they married in Denmark and she saw the statue. 1963, my father decided to build this bungalow. And the one at the front where the tank traps are is was owned by my uh, Pauline and Les, dear friends of theirs. And there were a couple more and theirs was the one at the back and it's still there today it's an airbnb nowadays and underneath it there's a nuclear bunker because i wish i had one at the moment don't you just to everyone let's hope for peace and i'm still hoping for a just peace between russia and the ukraine because at the end of the day you know i think that should stick that's still our best option but anyway moving on my dad built this massive nuclear bunker and put hydroponics and stuff down there and when he was asked why are you doing this Mr Roma he said well I found out that the local government had actually got their own nuclear bunker and all these important people were going to go down into the bunker and the Americans have got bunkers and all the government have got bunkers and I thought well what happens to me and my family and of course we were going to be left to be bombed and nuked so he said so I got my shotgun and I made myself a really decent bunker and when they come out I'll be waiting for them <laughs> okay my father had quite a bad sense of humor but i think he meant it to be honest but he built a nuclear bunker as you do uh 69 just after i'm born here possibly 1970 this is the berry free press and i'm the vague blob sitting on my mother's knee there the reason i'm telling this story is while dad's building the bunker what does he find but skulls in fact he finds bones 
There's my dad on the right there at 93. He was 93 years old one day when he came, Christian, Christian, come out. We are going to chop down some things. And he was standing there with his axe and grinning at me. So I took that photo. He lived a couple more years. But anyway, while he was digging away, uh, the little Danish troll here discovered some human remains. He discovered skull and he discovered bones and he just stacked them up and thought, well, it's a bit old. But my mother, being a bit more sensible than him, said, Gunner, you're digging up, you know, there's been a mass murder here because you're digging up human remains. So he said, oh, yeah, I'll call, the, I'll call the police. So he called the police. They called the coroner. I'm assuming that the coroner probably called uh, West Suffolk Archaeology Unit, which would have been Stan West in those days before Jude Bolivia. And Stan or someone came down to see him. I'm not entirely sure who it was because I only had my parents' account, which wasn't very... Uh, well, you'll, you'll get the idea. And basically, they took one look at the, two, at the bones and said, right, these are medieval. And you've there's obviously a medieval graveyard here associated with St. Saviour's. And we know it exists because when Man Egerton's, which was a kind of, it's now Abbey Ford, the car showroom was built, we found it. So on the slope opposite St. Saviour's and Tesco's, there's this burial ground and you're just at one end of it. So what we'd like you to do is just rebury with due ceremony, you know, say a few words and just rebury the bones. And my father said, of course, I'll do that. Now, it happened that at the time, bricks were quite expensive after the war. There was a housing shortage on 63, still quite an expensive time. It's not like the housing boom of the 80s, but anyway, it's still quite expensive to build your own house. And dad, who was a very good builder, used to have deliveries of concrete, cement, you know, sand, all the stuff you need, lead, obviously, for your bunker, you know, hydroponics, piping, shotguns, whatever else he was putting down there. And as he was doing all this, he um, he decided he discovered that his bricks kept going missing. Now, he knew damn well he thought who was doing it. But just to be on the safe side, he couldn't really accuse them. And he'd lurked around a few nights waiting in his hole in his deep pit dug for the basement, waiting for them to come so he could try and nip them. But he didn't get anywhere. So one night he decided what he'd do was he'd scare them. So he got some posts, fence posts, knocked them into the ground, got some nightlight candles, took some of his skulls he'd dug up out of the nettles, found the most intact ones he could, and put the nightlights or the candles underneath them, put the poles on the top. So in the dark, as you came over into his ground near his bricks, you'd suddenly just see glowing lights. And it said, uh, glowing eyes of the skulls. And he says that he claimed that the bloke who actually was doing it was so frightened, he screamed, ran all the way down Fornham Road and got hit by a car and was quite shaken up by the whole experience. But he never nicked any more bricks off dad. Which, to be honest, if I found out that somebody was trying to scare me off by posting human remains, I might think twice about stealing from them. Anyway, enough. This is the story. And uh, you'll be glad to know that I don't actually endorse doing this unless it's people who, you know, scream loudly late at night or are late returning library books or generally speaking, I think human remains should be sacrosanct. So why do I tell this story? Because shortly thereafter, weird things started to happen. Dad had invented one of the countless inventions of the uh, baby alarm system. It was a two-way radio system. He managed to sell the patent on his, so he made a few bob off it, which is good, because the idea is, you know, being it's been done very many times, but his was two-way. I'm surprised I didn't end up with a phobia, because he used to talk to me. If I started to cry at night, he'd come through on the, on the speaker and you'd hear him talking. But the important bit about this story was they started to hear voices chanting and they started to hear Latin and they started to hear weird voices. Now, the thing about that is it doesn't impress me much because anyone who's ever had a set of speakers is probably, if you live like me in Cheltenham, at least, we're always picking up taxi drivers and, uh, you know, snippets of radio transmissions. It's just a matter of having a cable the right length to act as a microphone and even if the radio is not on, the speakers sometimes come to life and I suddenly hear, oh, sorry, cat, I suddenly hear this noise and it's quite, it can startle you. So the fact that they were picking up voices on the baby alarm, maybe not so strange. Then there was an outbreak of what they might, of what 
we I would call you and I would call poltergeist activity. And if I ever go back to see my sisters and spend a bit of time chatting to them, I'll get some details of that. Because I never took the story seriously when I was young. And by the time I was old enough, I was always doing other stuff, looking after my parents, etc. But they had a lot of stories about weird things that happened in the house. But the one I remember is that there was one night they saw a figure in brown standing on the other side of the frosted glass. And they thought it was my grandfather who wore a bright brown raincoat. And they kept shouting at him to come in, come in, because it had the hood up. And when they went and threw the door open, there was no one there. So they then shut the door to see if it was a trick of the light and they couldn't see them. And they said whoever it was had stood there for a while, but there wasn't time for them to have escaped and got round the corner. Um, it's a shame Peter Hall's dead because he used to be a uh, theatrical chap. He used to come around to see them because he used to park his car outside. And I believe he knew quite a few of the stories as well. He knew something about what was going on. His mother lived in the next bungalow. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so that's another association of human remains and hauntings. Another obvious association, and again, I refer you to the Honourable Lady Claire Davy, who has already given a wonderful talk on the moving coffins of the Chase Vault. And we had a example of this also at Stanton in Suffolk. And I found another one in Dorset. I think Joe Nicholl has argued that the actual what's going on is that there never were moving coffins. They're Masonic allegories, and they tell you where the officers are standing within the vault of the temple in relation to the pillars, etc. I'm not a Mason, so I cannot judge how good that is as an explanation, but it is one explanation that he offered that I thought was at least highly interesting and potentially could be looked at. But the moving coffins of the Chase Vault and moving coffins generally are another association of hauntings and human remains. Finally, I'm going to move on to, I don't know what the time is. Um, it's quarter to eight. Okay, cool. I'm going to move on to one last aspect of the subject that I find extraordinarily interesting. Uh, a while ago, I was reading T.C. Lethbridge's book, Ghost and Ghoul, in which, curiously enough, the idea most associated with Lethbridge turns out not to, not to occur. But that's neither here nor there. Lethbridge had a number of different notions and ideas about hauntings, which he often referred to as ghouls, and he believed that it was possible that bodies of underground water could hold a some kind of signal that replayed as a haunting. Uh, but he also had other ideas, many of which were far more spiritualist, and he certainly had a belief in supernatural evil. But one of the things he likes to tell, he liked to tell stories about, and he doesn't ghost and ghoul and possibly in one of his other books, one of the Gog Magog books, is how every time they would get human remains, the Cambridge University car from the archaeology department would break down. So they'd dig up some graves, try and move the human remains, and terrible things would happen. You know, the car would break down. And, and in fact, on one occasion, somebody actually dies, nothing not related to the car breaking down. And again, it was just after they'd done a dig. And, and there was this almost superstitious fear. And... I then remembered something really odd because he mentions that on one occasion they opened a tumuli and there was a sudden, absolutely shocking downpour of rain. A massive, massive, massive downpour. And the skies just opened and everybody fled. And then I thought, hang on, where have I read that before? And knowing a little bit about archaeology but almost nothing compared with my friends like Dr Sivia and others who are actually archaeologists I thought okay I'm sure I've read this notion before somewhere so I had a quick look and then I remembered where I knew it from I grew up um just north of Berry on a farm an area called Colford Heath and Rhymer Point no relation which is just in the north of us is where seven parishes meet and our parish Colford is on the left of the road. On the right of the road is Livermere. And you've got Ampton as well, which is a small parish just in the north. So Livermere was home to this fellow when he was um, from about the age of three or four, I believe, till he went off to university and his parents lived there and he went back there for much of his life to Livermere Rectory, where his father was rector. His name was Montague Road James and he was a writer of English ghost stories. If I had been born precisely 100 years earlier, I would have grown up at the same time as him, and he would have ignored me, no doubt, as a mere pleb, but we would have at least 
travelled on the same coaches, travelled on the same trains and bought sweets from the same shop at Ingham, the only sweet shop in the area. And James and I were neighbours, but for a century, which I think is quite amazing, actually. I, I've always had a fondness since I, I found um, I had a weird set of experiences at Bell Champs. I've told the story in another video, so I'm not going to do it again. But there's a few things that link me with James, which I'm quite fond of. And I, I like to talk about him. But as you're going over to Livermere from our farm, you would get to this wonderful house where I think I lived here briefly when I was three or four years old. We came back from Denmark and for a while I lived at Seven Hills House, which is a magnificent house, even more magnificent now that it has a swimming pool and many other things. Um, it was built as a dower house for uh, the Duggan family, I believe, when they had the Colford estate. And it's a gorgeous building, very nice building, but directly across the road from Seven Hills Rectory, there is a which is this building there's a line of trees and there are three cottages set there that are owned by old friends of mine from school and set in amongst those trees are some of these now you can probably barely see these because the one on the left is Howe hill at barnum it's a tumulus and the one on the right is the hill of health at uh, colford heath or between colford heath and west stowe which is in the King's Forest, right on the farm. And these are two that I knew when I was growing up, but there are seven more of these very small tumuli. And they weren't always very small. They were once much larger, but they've been ploughed out. And also they're in the Breckland. So the sand over the centuries has been eroded. So, but there are seven of these hills, and that's where the name Seven Hills comes from, from the seven tumuli. And in the 1860s or 70s, they did a dig and they opened up one of them and pretty much anyone who was anybody came along um the chap from elverdon uh who is very important in uh sikhism got his name now but he was a favorite of queen victoria when he was young an exiled indian prince who had a wonderful uh Duleep singh Duleep singh he had a wonderful estate at elverdon uh Kedugan was there and various other luminaries were there most of the local clergy turned out and there was a bit of a picnic atmosphere and the labourers, the farm workers, did the digging, obviously. And suddenly they discovered the chamber and they discovered human remains in the form of some bones and some ceramic pots with ashes in shades of Thomas Brown's urn burial. And as they uncovered this, suddenly there was a blast of thunder, the crackle of lightning across the sky. And the rain was so heavy that everybody from peers of the realm to the humblest gamekeeper or servant ran across the road and crowded all together into Seven Hills House. And they were all jumbled up and mixed up, as somebody said in an account from the time I found, which made me laugh. But the storm was terrible. And it was so much that when they went back, it had partially collapsed. And so I've started to make a series of notes on and when tombs have been opened and this incredibly freakish weather has suddenly been reported and there's no logical reason why opening a tomb would cause a storm the notion there's any connection is utterly insane but i'd like you all to play the game and just see how many examples you can find of exactly that happening and here's one of them Richard III was, as many of you will know, recently discovered after the Battle of Bosworth, he'd been killed. He was interred somewhat hastily um, in a local monastic or religious place at Leicester. And the exact location was long since lost. And it, as it happened, there was a car park that somebody calculated was possibly correct. Nobody actually believed that he would be under the car park. The idea was well, at best, it was a bit of a PR job because, you know, it seemed like a good pot. There was a slight possibility he would be. But none of the historians, none of the archaeologists, none of the members of the Richard III Society and none of his linear descendants had turned up for DNA purposes and had been brought along actually believed they would find him. And when they were trying to decide where to dig, somebody said, we may as well start with the R is for Richard, assuming that was what it was for. 
And the car park attendant said, no, that's reserved. <laughs> what we were reserving the parking space. So we had a reserved parking space. Anyway, they dug under the R for Richard anyway. And, oh, sorry. What did they find? They found Richard III. And as they first hit the bones and they found his left arm, I think it was, you can guess what happened. The skies opened and they absolutely had to chuck a tent up and run for it. No one could stay out there. And they said it was almost unnatural how hard it rained. It was as if the heavens wept. So I found this in a Victorian newspaper article. I found it on the BBC in real connection with Richard III. And I keep finding more and more examples. You disturb a tomb or human remains. And this isn't folklore. This is actually in archaeological reports. So can anyone think of any other cases? If anyone can, and you've got more information on that, I am fascinated by it. I'm sure it's just coincidence. It's not like it doesn't rain a lot in England. If it happened when they opened Tuchenhamen's tomb or something like that, assuming that that was really the date when they opened it, there's now some controversy about that. Suggestions that Carter had stolen objects from before, though whether that's true or not, I've got no way of telling. But anyway, anything like that, if you can find any examples, preferably from places where rainstorms aren't quite as common as England, please let me know. So this leads to the final question, which is, why should there be a connection between human remains and hauntings? Well, if there is, how long do we stick around? Do we haunt graveyards? Do we spend, do we attend our own funerals? Is consciousness actually in somehow in some way invested with our body? And if we cremate it, what happens to the spirit then? I don't know. The notion that human remains are associated with hauntings is an ancient and archetypal one. It's one that psychical research has tended to dismiss for well over 100 years, largely on the basis of the telepathic hypothesis of hauntings, which is that hauntings are simply a projection that are then rendered as hallucinations by the brain. But they, they are actually a picking up of information from some other location that's being rendered by a telepathy. Is that the case? I don't know. Could human remains be involved in telepathy? I don't know. Could a very, they, they say some dogs are able to smell human remains. Is that true? Again, I don't know, because many, many, many claims about tracking dogs and about the capacity of dogs to find human bodies strike me as being about as reliable as the claims of psychic detectives. I'm not saying it hasn't ever happened or that there isn't evidence for it or that it can't happen. I'm just saying that very often the claims are disputed and the more you look at them, the harder it becomes to establish the truth. Is it possible that decomposition or de decay actually gives off some kind of remain some kind of sense that our bodies pick up and that we read as a psychic impression maybe but if so i'd be surprised if they were getting through this car park or whatever else yeah but this is where i'm going to end because i'm not sure what the time is and i'm not feeling very well so there's one story that i'd like to tell and there's a stately home i can't remember which one it is now um i'll find out and put it in the thing later but it doesn't matter for the purposes of the story i assume it's in nottinghamshire there's a home which has for centuries been haunted, supposedly, by the coast of one other King Charles Spaniel, which I believe is associated with King Charles or some other monarch or some other aristocrat. And the ghostly dog was always seen in the vicinity of a tree or in the vicinity of a certain part of the grounds. And while they were doing some excavations or clearing up after a tree fell down in the 90s, late 90s, what did they find but buried in the appropriate space some King Charles Spaniel um, remains where the dog had been seen? Is that because somebody subsequently buried the dogs where the ghost dog was seen or were they dated to the time? If any animal can come back from beyond the grave, it will be cats and King Charles Spaniels. Cats and dogs who are strongly associated with humans and horses strike me as ideal candidates for haunting. You very rarely hear accounts of ghostly Parisian cows. I've only known two, I think. So my guess is that ultimately connection with humans and emotions invested in them might cause hauntings. Who knows? But is there a connection between human remains and apparitions? I think that the spiritualists would say yes. The parapsychologists would say no. 
and for once that the money and evidence is clearly on the side of spiritualism. Anyway, that was my hastily improvised talk on ghosts, beers for bones. I hope it was mildly amusing. And I'll now throw it open for discussion and questions, if any. Claire, are you able to take over? Yes, of course I am. Yeah, we'll um we'll go through some questions and CJ, if you're okay to just stay there a bit longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll answer the questions if there are any, if I can. If you if you could not die imminently, that would be great. Bleah. That was me dying um, imminently. <laughs> Thank so you. So I definitely. actually died half an hour ago, and this is my 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 spirit associated with human remains is actually here haunting you even now. I just did it you're better always, than even Bruce. You Willis. always go the extra mile for us, up, aren't you? Uh, I, 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 Absolutely, absolutely. I will come back and haunt you, Claire, I promise, okay? <laughs> well, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, yeah, it was really enjoyable and we do appreciate you doing it, stepping in at the last minute and obviously knowing you're not well either. So, and, and we even managed to touch on the subject of this evening's talk, which was to be that of animal ghosts. So we've covered that a little bit as well. And um, yeah, it was just lovely. Thank you so much. Um, if anybody...